All right. My name is Rich Schmidt. We're here with Matt Volstek at Amatera Winery in Portland. It's January 10th, 2023. Matt, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you. Uh, the first question to get you started is why wine? Why wine? That's a really difficult <laughs> question, actually. It's kind of multifaceted. Uh, I think I was aware of the wine industry just having grown up going to visit my aunt and uncle at Oak Knoll and going to those wine festivals and just being around uh, the winery. So I was aware of the wine industry, but didn't really think that was going to be something that I was going to pursue. Um, and then I was starting uh, school at Oregon State, and I was studying microbiology, and uh, really loved the subject matter, but could tell pretty early on that I wanted to find something that was applied. And uh, over the course of my studies, I found the food science department, and that was right when they were launching the fermentation science program. So I heard about that, I walked over and transferred in immediately. And most of the people uh, who were transferring into food science, into the fermentation program, wanted to go into the brewing side. When I looked at it, uh, I figured out pretty quickly that wine was, was interesting to me. Uh, and at first, it started out just as, I think, a, an interesting way to apply the, the, the sciences that I was studying. And then it quickly became something more mm -hmm. uh, when I started working in the cellars. So we'll come back and catch that up in a second. But tell me a little bit about life before Oregon State. Life before Oregon State. So I'm an Oregon native, so born and raised in, here in Portland. Um, uh, grew up just five minutes away from Amaterra. Um, went to Jesuit High School before Oregon State. Um, was an athlete um, involved in school, and uh, yeah, and then moved on to Oregon State for for college. And what prompted you to go to OSU? The fact that OSU is a land, sea, and space grant university, and I knew that I wanted to do something in the sciences. Uh, and then I visited Oregon State and just fell in love with the campus. So it was just all of those things. So tell me about your initial experiences then, ed both educationally and sort of uh, working in a cellar side. Yeah. What was your first impression of working with wine? So the first job that I had in a winery was with a, uh, was at a winery that's no longer um, um, in business. And it was about 20 minutes away from Oregon State, 30 minutes away. And so my first job was as, um, as a lab assistant, but it also involved some topping and actually ended up involving also some vineyard work. Um, and so it was, when I started, it was the slow season, so it wasn't super exciting. I was running free sulfurs and topping barrels. So I didn't start in a harvest role, which is, I think, more exciting for sure. And then it rolled into uh, vineyard work in the spring. So I was out, you know, uh, tucking and uh, shoot thinning and, and, and learning some of that. So it was pretty broad, actually, the experience first off. Mm -hmm. uh, unfortunately, they were going out of business at the time that I was working there. Um, so that ended pretty quickly. Um, and then after that, I uh, had gotten to know Barney Watson a little bit at Oregon State. And so he found out that they had gone out of business and uh, wanted to help me continue on working. And he had an opening at Taiyi as a seller hand. So I started working for him at Taiyi. Um, as well as at Oregon State in the Enology Extension Lab. So helping to process pre-harvest uh, samples for phenolic maturity and the different studies that they were doing at the time. So that's, I think that's when I really got excited about, about the industry. What was it that prompted that excitement? Uh, I think it was when I first started working at Taiyi. Um, it immediately became clear to me that the people who were, well, the founders, Margie and Dave and uh, Barney and Nola, they were it was more than just making wine. It was, uh, it was, it was um, creating something. It was creating community um, and really trying to make special, thoughtfully made wines. And there was something about that uh, quality-driven focus and pursuit that I just loved. So, yeah. I'm curious, uh, since you started working at the same time you were in school, tell me uh -huh. about the difference between sort of what you were learning in school and what you were seeing firsthand in the actual, in the actual cellar. Sure. So the food science program, the fermentation program at the time, now they've taken the program further, of course. At the time, the fermentation program was an option. So it was a, it was a food science degree. So there was a lot of uh, food analysis, food chemistry, uh, you know, thermal processing, all that stuff. And then interwoven with that was the, was the fermentation classes, which included wine, sensory, uh, distilling, brewing, and, and pretty, pretty broad subject matter. Mm -hmm. So the timing worked out that when I started to get into working in the cellars, I was getting into my um, uh, junior and senior level coursework. So it was actually really appropriate. Um, I was taking uh, the wine class while I was working in a cellar. I think that was, that was pretty neat. Mm -hmm. um, really rounded out the experience. So, so. Um, 
So it was, uh, so it was general food science, but then there was the fermentation stuff, uh, you know, interwoven. Mm -hmm. So a lot of overlap. And ironically, you know, Varney was my teacher for some of the coursework, but he was also my boss both at school and at the winery. So, so I saw a lot of Barney. For sure. That's yeah. a lot of time yeah. with Barney yeah. Watson. Yeah. yeah. How did it compare to when you're at, when you're when you're doing the work? How does it compare to what you're reading in a textbook? Uh, when you're working with Barney, very very closely. Um, I was fortunate in that when you work in the cellar with him, you're not just working. So you might be up on a tank hosing something out, um, and he's asking you questions about why you're doing things, right? So, um, so there was a lot of overlap, and I feel really fortunate that I had that experience because it helped, it helped connect the dots between the, um, between the cellar work and the, and the, uh, and the coursework. So you've, so you've got, your, you got your education, you've gotten some enthusiasm about the industry. Yeah. Uh, so as you're getting towards close to graduation, mm -hmm. what are you thinking about for your future? Finding a job, <laughs> and how am I gonna how am I gonna take this to the next step? So, um, I because I changed majors during the during the course of, of school, it did set me back a little bit. So I did work. Uh, I, I spent two more terms at, at OSU, um, uh, and so that gave me one more harvest to work too, actually. Um, and then when I finished school in the winter term, um, I actually traveled with a friend who was also in the fermentation science program. Um, he was more on the brewing side. Um, but we took the opportunity to travel in Europe a little bit um, and visited a lot of breweries and a lot of wineries while we were over there. And so that just further, um, further solidified the, you know, the, the desire to be in the industry. When I got back, um, I, I had already been applying for jobs before I left, but when I got back, I got to work pretty quick trying to find a, a job because I needed, I, was, I think it was June when I got back, and so I wanted to make sure that I was at a winery and landed before harvest. And, that's when I found the position at the Hogue Cellars in Washington. So I did make the, did make the move to go to Washington from Oregon, which was, um, you know, it was, it was a big decision because I was leaving Pinot Noir and what I had worked with. The winemaking there was a lot different. Uh, I had a lot to learn in terms of um, just a uh, warmer climate out there. Um, you know, they add acid. We had, I had never done an acid add in the cellar because it was 97 and 98. And, we just didn't need to add acid on those years. And so there was just some really simple things that, um, that were interesting to learn going up there. Um, so, so yeah, so I moved up to Washington, I think it was July of 90, 99, and uh, that was my first harvest at Hogue. So you mentioned obviously things to learn in a very different, kind of different approach. Mm -hmm. What was that first harvest in Washington like? Well, we went from, I mean, I think we were doing, at the time, I think we were doing probably 75 tons at, uh, at Taiyi, and I went to Hogue and we did five or 6,000 tons that first year. And so I was in a production enologist role, but they pretty much immediately put me into a shift winemaker role, um, graveyard of course. So uh, you know, there was a lot to learn. There was a lot of just volume uh, being called out to the crush pad for press cuts. It was a very, um, I wasn't doing the hands-on transfers and things and rackings, but I was, involved in uh, writing the work orders, overseeing, doing, uh, like I said, you know, press cuts and kind of real-time winemaking decisions, mm -hmm. and, and, a, and a high volume of them, which was, I think, really good, really good practice for a, for a young winemaker, right? So. Any particular memories from that time of, of decisions that you were proud of or things that maybe uh, did, didn't turn out as well as you hoped? Oh my gosh. Uh, one thing that didn't turn out as I hoped is there was a, a picnic down at the there's two wineries there, and at the lower winery, which was the old winery, that was where the tasting room was, and there was a big grass area where they would do picnics. Well, behind a big hedge line were some tanks, and uh, I had gone down to do an addition into one of those tanks, and I bumped the goof mixer, and uh, unfortunately, it flashed the tank right behind the, uh, the picnic, and so behind these people's picnic was, um, you know, white wine foam <laughs> coming up over the hedge. And so I just tried to hide behind the tank and not be, not be seen as the one who did that. Um, so it turned out that the picnic was, uh, was a group that was friends with the winery owner and they all thought it was hilarious. And you know, those spills always look worse than they are. You know, you thought it was gonna be a thousand gallons, but it's just foam, it was probably 20 gallons that was lost on a, on a pretty big tank. So, so that didn't go as I planned, for sure, but it was a good learning lesson. <laughs> And then some things that went well there at Hogue, um, we were, that was early on in the use of microlocks. 
And so Hogue was definitely a leader in that. So they had a pretty sophisticated system with manifolds for the, for the microwalk system on, on the tank tops. And we were doing that in conjunction with um, uh, stave inserts on those tanks. And uh, I was fortunate to get to work with um, Nico Kie at the time there. He was a red winemaker. And he was the, the active winemaker overseeing the red wine making program. And so I learned a lot about uh, development of wine with oxygen, controlling reduction, not going so far with, um, with oxidation. And I think that was, that was awesome experience. And I really enjoyed that. And the wines turned out great. I mean, people couldn't, we would taste them blind and the quality was really, really high for the, for the methodology that was being used. So that was really exciting. So. Finding a way to use your applied sciences right, sure. right on the bat. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm curious, uh, coming off of working in Oregon, small cellar, hands-on, going to that, yeah. what did you think of the kind of the juxtaposition there and what did you think going forward the role you wanted to play would be? Uh, I knew that I liked the smaller winemaking projects and Hogue was awesome in that. Um, and I had a great experience at Hogue. Uh, Hogue was awesome in that while we were making large scale um, uh, wines for national distribution, they were also doing a program called Genesis at the time, which has grown up into a larger, um, into a larger program now. But at the time it was uh, wines that were made for the tasting room only. So in a couple hundred case mm -hmm. um, formats. And they were like little winemaker special projects. And so um, we did lots of fun stuff. We, the first rosé that I made was there. Um, it was a Sangiovese uh, Sagne, and it was super delicious. And so that was, um, I loved that experience. We made some barrel fermented Chenin Blanc and just lots of really interested, really interesting smaller lot um, wines. And I, while I liked the, the larger winemaking side, it was interesting and uh, it was definitely interesting. And just that scale is, it's, I don't know how to describe it, it's, it's, it's fun to work with, mm -hmm. but it was those smaller projects um, that I just was you know, really more engaged with, I think. So that, that led me to the feeling that I probably wanted to end up in um, winemaking that was smaller lot and a little bit more just attention to the detail um, on, the, on the vineyard block through versus the larger scale farming and the, um, and the combination of vineyards and vineyard blocks, so yeah. And so at that point, you had obviously you had, had vineyard experience at Taiyi and it's at other places. Yeah. Um, how much time? How much did you enjoy time in the vineyards versus time in the winery? Uh, I loved time in the vineyards. Most of the time that I was spending at that point was doing vineyard inspections or walks. And so uh, at Hogue, they assigned me a couple of vineyards. At first, I would go with uh, either David Forsyth, who was the lead winemaker, director of winemaking. Uh, Ko Dan and Nico Kie were the other two winemakers. And so I would go out with them and walk vineyards that they were overseeing. And then they, uh, um, on my second year, they gave me a couple vineyards to do my own walks in. Um, of course, they were not ones that they were really you know, too, too concerned about. So, but at least I got the experience to do it. Um, I loved that time. Um, you, you walked a lot. You got to see the incremental changes over the growing season. And then we would document those and talk about them in the winery that would you know, ultimately lead to maybe some different picking decisions or, or whatever downstream. Um, so I really, really enjoyed that. Um, but I wasn't on the tractor necessarily, you know, we're doing, doing that, that type of farming at that point in time. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. I'm curious about um, as, you, as you get to kind of get to know a vineyard, how do you mm -hmm. evaluate a vineyard and what is it you're looking for at various times of the year that you were learning at that point that you sort of get to sort of follow through your career? Yeah. At that, at that point, we were looking at different things than I look at now. Of course, there's completely different viticulture up there than it is in the Willamette Valley. Um, there, we were looking at uh, how well water was being applied. Um, generally, fruit set. Um, we were looking for just general, how well is the vineyard being trained and managed. Mm -hmm. And you know, there, we were worried about making sure that the fruit got through the vegetal kind of flavor and aroma. Um, and by doing that, you know, you need to control canopy, control crop, and control the water. And so that was a main focus, right? Just looking at the overall canopy and, and, and health of the vineyard block. Um, and most of those vineyard walks were during the growing season. Um, of course, we'd go out in the winter every once in a while, but really most of the time spent was, uh, was during the, the growing season. Mm -hmm. Down here, which is I think probably maybe down here, um, it's similar, but uh, you know, 
I spend a little bit more time in the winter just looking at when things are being pruned, um, how they're being pruned. Uh, you know, there are, you know, most everything's VSP, right? But there are some, there are some different uh, approaches to even that um, in terms of how many buds are left and, mm -hmm. and, and those types of, um, of, of factors. So that's what I'm looking at during the winter. Um, and then really from then on in the spring, it's looking at when the growing season's gonna start and then key, key milestones. Um, and we track all those, of course. And then, of course, during the summer, it's, you know, we're looking for stage and variation and, again, fruit set and um, overall health, canopy, um, when to make decisions on leaf, leaf, leaf removal, um, what leaves to remove, um, all, all those things, you know. Mm -hmm. But uh, I would say that I'm, I'm out there quite a bit, not as much as I would like, of course, but, um, but I get out quite a bit, yeah. So what came next to you after the Hogue? So I had met my wife, Nancy, in Washington. She was also an Oregonian. And, uh, you know, we were, um, we were young and wanted to be in the, in the, in the cool city, Portland. And so um, we both decided that we wanted to, to move back to Portland. And so we independently moved back together. So <laughs> that's, and, uh, so, but we moved back at the same time. Uh, and had kind of a crazy start. Um, I accepted a position that, that wasn't the right position, unfortunately, and so um, I, I didn't stay there. And I was transitioning to a harvest role, um, and I was out on a morning run, and I got hit by a car. <laughs> and uh, I was really fortunate in that it was just, uh, it was a glancing blow. And uh, ironically, the only reason that I saw the car coming is because a delivery truck was, was gonna turn out and saw the car coming and honked at me to give me a warning and right then I turned around and I was able to jump at the last minute. And so, um, you know, I, I'm probably the only person who can say that beer saved my life because that was a beer delivery truck. Um, so, so, so there you go. Um, but at any rate, I was fine, but I was a little, um, I didn't really want to go work a harvest. That I had to go, you know, get some treatment for a neck or whatever and for, mm -hmm. for, for, for neck strain. So I took the time to, uh, I missed the harvest. Um, full time. I still spent some time at a couple wineries, um, but I wasn't doing the punch downs. Uh, and I took a job um, selling wine and cheese for six months, and it was a fantastic experience. I got to taste a lot of international wines with the, when the reps would come through. I learned a bunch about cheese, which was interesting, and it was kind of a placeholder thing, right? Um, and then it was shortly after that that I um, met Tony Reinders um, and went to work at Domain Serene. So it all worked out for a reason, I guess. But yeah. kind of got, it's weird, weird to kind of skip a harvest, though, or to like not not be fully invested in a harvest. To not be fully into it, I was still um, I was still at two two wineries a lot during the harvest, so I still felt like I was kind of engaged in what was going on with the vintage. But yeah, it was a disappointment for sure. Mm -hmm. But and what year was that? Uh, that would have been 2000, 2000 or two thousand one, two thousand one. So tell me about meeting Tony and what led you to, to work, go working with him. Yeah, so uh, Tony um, had worked at Hogue actually previously and was still good friends with, um, with Co Din. And so just kind of through networking with Co and they knew that I was looking for, for a position in the Willamette Valley. And so I just met uh, Tony through Co and they were looking, Tony was looking for an enologist, kind of more assistant winemaker type person to, um, to help. Um, and so that's how I met Tony. Um, and the timing was incredible because that's right when uh, they were moving into the new winery. So I started um, before any fruit was processed there and kind of helped um, shake down the winery, um, which was really good experience for Amaterra because, you know, new buildings, they, they take some time to figure out. Um, and so we worked through a lot those, those, the, 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 those years that I was at Domain Serene. Tell me about that experience there, obviously making a new, new, new facility, making yeah. a lot of wine, a lot of really good wine. Mm -hmm. What was it like? What was it like? Uh, dynamic. Um, it's a really, it was a big facility at the time for the crew that had come from the Rockbach facility in, in Carlton, which was you know, one, one level flat. All of a sudden, you've got multiple levels. Um, just even that is complicated to work with. Um, but it was great. I mean, the crew was really was really fun, knowledgeable. Um, the winemaking quality was total quality focus, which I, I loved. Um, we there was definitely a an emphasis on keeping the house style mm -hmm. um, and keeping the winemaking consistent. So 
that was good because you know I think consistency is, is great for a winery. But Tony was awesome in that he he also encouraged ideas for experimentation in a small percentage, and so he let me bring ideas forward and and we did them. So um, we did some stuff like uh, uh, we did a we did a repasso technique on some Pinot Noir that turned out great. You know who would have thought? Um, we did some extended maceration trials side by sides, and we, we played a little bit in the winemaking too, and I really, really enjoyed that. Um, so yeah, I had great experience with Tony there. So, yeah. What did you find as you were in that job that you did, hadn't already experienced or didn't already know? Uh, I will, so at the time, they weren't planning on being open to the public um, at, the, at the winery. The, there was a full kitchen and an event space, but that was designed to be more for I think for distribution entertainment mm -hmm. and um, wine club or whatever that would be. Mm -hmm. So we didn't have a lot of visitors. And so while I love the six or seven people that were working there, um, I'm a little extroverted. And uh, I found that I loved when visitors came. And so what I realized was that you know, we would have um, operations meetings and we'd find out that there was a tour coming. And people would say, who wants to do it? And half the group cringed and I, I would say, I'll, I'll take the tour, I, I love talking about this place. And so I realized pretty quickly that, uh, that, that sales or customer facing roles might be something that I would also enjoy. Um, I definitely learned that there. I mean, you know, we're, it's pretty far out there and with not, not being open, there was no traffic. And mm -hmm. so, yeah. I mean. uh, how long did you stay and what came next? So I was there for two vintages, so a little over two years. Um, and I, like I said, I was realizing that I wanted to do something that was more interactive with people. Mm -hmm. um, so my intention was to go um, into a sales role. That didn't really play out at first. Um, I actually ended up working for the Oregon State Department of Agriculture um, for a little over a year. Um, took the environmental health exam and did all that and learned a bunch and that was, that was great. Um, and actually, we're really fortunate that wineries are inspected by that, by that agency. They're just fantastic to work with. And I got to do some fun stuff while I was there, like train the, um, train the team on wineries and winemaking. Oh, that's cool. And so, you know, so we don't, so they wouldn't write up violations that weren't appropriate for wineries. Um, I got to update the, the, the Oregon Wine Glossary for the OSDA um, that had already been created. I just updated it and kind of enhanced it. So there were some fun little projects um, there, um, but I enjoyed that. But at the same time, when I was leaving Domain Serene to go do that, Part of the reason that I was leaving is because I had an opportunity to, um, to take over managing a small vineyard. Um, it was kind of a family friend of my dad's who knew that I was working in, in wineries and they had an existing vineyard, small acreage, um, that they were having problems with the current vineyard manager. And so he asked me to have coffee and I went to have coffee with him and I think he was asking me there to just see if I knew anybody who would take it over <laughs> and also to visit. And so he told me about the situation and he said, do you, do you, do you know anybody? And I looked at him and I said, well, what about, what about me? I could, I could take a shot at this. And so he kind of chuckled and said, okay, and said, well, write up your business plan and uh, you know, a budget and what you need and, uh, and let's talk about it. So I had a meeting back with him three or four days later. I had been on the phone with OVS. I had been on the phone with you know, getting all these numbers and quotes and trying to figure out what size tractor I had never bought vineyard equipment before. Um, so put together a proposal you know, with labor and all that, uh, essentially a pretty simple pro forma for, for what they needed. Mm -hmm. And he said, that's great, go ahead and go do that. And so, and, so, and so we did. And so Nancy and I, my wife Nancy and I took over um, that little vineyard. We, it, was, it had been poorly pruned and poorly maintained. Um, and so we pruned it the first year, just she and I, um, with our Jack Russell Terrier at the time. Um, and uh, had a great time out there pruning in the pouring rain. Um, and then I bought the, the tractor and the sprayer. It was a little 50-gallon Rankin backpack or uh, three-point um, sprayer. And I had no idea how to run this equipment. And so then I needed to figure out how to run it and uh, got some good coaching from um, Dennis at OVS, who's an awesome guy. Um, got some good coaching on how to calibrate the sprayer, how to look at application rates, you know, what kind of maintenance. And so, you know, I did the calibration before I started spraying and then um, started, started doing the, the hands-on maintenance for this vineyard. Uh, and so I, I had been in vineyards a lot looking at, the, looking at the canopy and looking at all that and it's 
pretty easy to be critical of things when you're just walking through and writing up a report, but then when you get to be the one to go take care of it, it's, uh, it's, it's humbling for sure. <laughs> um, so, so that was great. So I actually took care of that vineyard for, I think it was 13 years as a side, uh, as a side business. Um, and we, you know, we harvested the fruit. I had wine made for them. Um, I arranged the custom uh, winemaking um, contract and made sure the fruit got there, made sure glass and corks and all that. And so it was kind of virtually making wine for, for somebody else um, as a moonlighting um, uh, deal. So it's pretty fun. And so as you're doing that, uh, what else is sort of filling your time after you leave the Department of Ag? So I left the Department of Ag for a position at a company called BioMariu, and it's a uh, French-based microbiology diagnostics company. And I started uh, there as a regional account manager in a region that they weren't sure that they that could justify a territory. And so they said, um, you know, we, we want to give you a shot in this, but you have to get to this revenue level by this you know, time to, to make it sustainable. And so I, 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 I did that, and I started traveling and calling on food and environmental labs um, and, uh, yeah, working with them on their instrument in, instrumentation for screening and identification of microorganisms. So fascinating. Actually, really awesome. Um, so I was there for six years. Um, had great experience, worked my way up to regional position. I was covering from Wisconsin to Texas and West. Uh, we, had, we were having a family, uh, so had um, Kate, who's now a freshman, and Carter, who's in eighth grade now, um, during, during that time. And then we were, still, um, we were still taking care of that vineyard. And then I had also picked up a couple other consulting clients, um, which, was, uh, which was awesome. Um, there was uh, a cider company that was starting that was having a lot of problems with reduction in their ciders. And so um, I helped them for a while figuring out fermentations, which was great. Um, and then uh, I worked with Bertoni at Abbey Creek from, I think, 2008 to 13, um, working with him on getting his winemaking program set up and had so much fun with Bertoni, such a cool guy. And um, yeah, we had a lot of laughs. Um, but there was a lot of you know, kind of consulting by text message mm -hmm. while I was traveling. Um, but uh, so I was still in the industry, just kind of on the outside a little bit on a full-time basis, but, but still in it on the, on the side. Mm -hmm. so. And just, just sort of, just sort of sciencing all over the place there yeah. too, just whatever, whatever yeah. science is needed. Yep. Uh, so I know at some point you started uh, consulting winemaking company for, so what, right. what, point of the, what point in the process does that happen? So it was 03, 2003 that we started the vineyard piece. Um, and then we added the kind of the winemaking and other, you know, whatever other consulting project piece to it in 2008. And we uh, were super creative. Our last name is Volstek. So when we started the vineyard piece, we called it V Vineyard. Yes, <laughs> yes. Uh, that was not very creative. But, uh, and then when we added the, the kind of the winemaking consulting piece to it, we um, changed it from a DBA into an LLC and started a farm to cork. So that was what our consulting company um, uh, was called. So that's what we did business as. And then, so after, so after BioMariu, well, I was at BioMariu and doing really well, um, but I was contacted by a company called Paul Corporation in 2011, I think it was, and they, they were looking for someone on the West Coast to lead a food and beverage sales team, and Paul makes uh, filtration and separation technologies. So they were, they're a large player in wine um, with their cross-flow filters, as well as filter sheets and membrane cartridges and all of that. And so um, I was contacted because I had this kind of crazy LinkedIn profile of sales, but also wine. And, uh, and uh, so I ended up um, being recruited to go work for Paul. And I was um, here in Portland, but I was based out of New York. Um, so managing the West Coast business for the food and beverage group. Um, and that really got, I mean, I was calling on a few wineries, but larger ones with BioMariu, because the, that diagnostic stuff is really only appropriate for big, big wineries. Um, but with Paul, I was in contact with every winery. Um, so, I mean, everyone who was filtering, at least. Um, and, you know, we worked through Scott Labs, which were great to work with um, on a lot of the products, but a lot of the products, we worked directly with the wineries. And so 
that was interesting to work in that environment where you have part distribution. But at any rate, uh, I was back in the wineries on a day-to-day -day basis and breweries and other mm -hmm. um, food and beverage. But uh, so I was uh, being back in the wineries every day. I was feeling more and more like how much I was missing being, being in the wineries and just really enjoying working with winemakers on optimizing treatments for wine, uh, less loss, better quality, all that, all that. And uh, having the chance to be in so many win wineries, I was getting to see a lot of different design approaches to the, to the facilities, but also winemaking approaches. And so kind of, you know, wine is funny. You, there's always a different approach. You know, um, there's always new treatments. There's always new timing to do things. And so hearing from people how they're approaching things um, was, 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 was great experience. And I learned a lot from other people while I was trying to help them with, with filtration. So. so you kind of get the, the, the bug to get back into, into wineries full time. For sure. So what happened yeah. next? Then I was promoted at Paul. And uh, yay. <laughs> and uh, so uh, the timing was crazy. Paul had actually been acquired by a company called Danaher. And, um, Right before that, I had moved into a marketing and sales optimization role, enablement role. And so we were looking at, I was leaving the food and beverage group and going into a role that was across all of the different verticals and trying to help standardize both marketing and sales processes just at a corporate level for efficiency and you know, trying, to, trying to help the business perform better. And so I was interacting with a lot of different business units in this continuous improvement enablement role. And so that's where I got a little bit of exposure to the, to the world of continuous improvement that we brought here to Amaterra. So I think that was, I think that's important to mention just because a lot of the approach and the design here and even in our operation, we do continuous improvement um, sessions here on a regular basis and we've applied a lot of those concepts. But I was also traveling internationally and that was an international role, global role. And um, at the same time, I was also, I had already started consulting on this project. So it was kind of getting to a point where I needed to make a decision because the, the role at, at Paul was awesome, but it was also taking a lot. Um, and we were, we had started 51 weeks winemaking and we were growing that and more consulting business was coming. And so at what point could I get back to winemaking again? So there was, there was a, there was a, it was a tough decision, I guess. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. But it, but I think I made the right one. Yeah. Well, before we talk about Amaterra, tell yeah. me about Fifty One Weeks. Sure. Uh, how did that come about? Well, um, Fifty One Weeks. Um, Nancy, my wife, and I founded it in 2012, and uh, you know, it it really comes from um, we were making wine for other people and having a great time doing that. Um, but we had just had our second child. I was. I was about a year before and I was just about ready to finish an MBA and we looked at each other and it was like, hey, we should, we should do this for ourselves. We should make some wine. We don't need to make a bunch, but, but we, should, we should start making some wine for, you know, for us. It's, it's, it's fun. You know, there wasn't really like the plan to, to try to blow it up into anything huge, but it was, um, we both had an interest in doing that and so we looked at each other and said, it's never going to get easier. You know, back in school, two little tiny kids. And so we just said, let's do it. And so um, the name 51 Weeks came about from the fact that our kids are 51 weeks apart, like to the day. And so it's named, you know, for them, and, but, it's, but particularly also that time period. That time period was a lot of joy and happy things hap that happened. We also had some struggles. And so to us, 51 Weeks just means um, that you get both. Things aren't going to get any easier. So if you want to do something, just do it. Um, and so that, that was the spirit of... Of, of, of naming it that, so. And the name was Nancy's idea, so. Got to give credit there, yeah. It's a good yeah, name, yeah. it's a good name. Thanks. So with, uh, you obviously at that point had a lot of winemaking experience, as you said, you're making wine for a lot of people. Yeah. So what was it about making wine for yourself that you wanted to either do differently? Was there a new style you wanted to try? Sure. Or what, what was it about that was gonna define yeah. your own personal wine? Um, great question. Uh, so, and we weren't making wine for a ton of people. There was just a couple of people that we were making wine for. But, um, you know, when we started 51 Weeks, we, we, both Nancy and I, Pinot Noir is like our favorite wine. And so we, we did want to make Pinot Noir, but we also realized that we were going to be a tiny, self-distributed, 
new wine brand. And even at that time, there weren't as many wineries as there are now, but even, even at that time, there was a lot, of, um, a lot of brands, right? And so we decided that we wanted to um, start with something that wasn't as readily available in Oregon so that we would have something that was a little bit different when we went to go pour for people that might catch their attention. And one of the grape varieties that always fascinated me when I was in Washington, so one of the grape varieties that, that really fascinated me when I was in Washington was Petit Verdot. You know, it's planted in such small, um, such small acreage, really, in, in, in general. Um, and it's kind of an afterthought. Mm -hmm. And so uh, I found that there was this Petit Verdot fruit that was these tiny berries and super intense blueberry aromas and flavors. And it was, like I said, a, a bit of an afterthought. It was processed like everything else. But with that, with those tiny berries, the wine would just become a monster in terms of extraction. And I always thought there was like something else we could do with Petit Verdot that would be more interesting, right? And so when we were talking about varieties, uh, Petit Verdot came up as something that we thought, hey, that could be fun. And what if we made it in a gentle way? And what if we treated it completely different? maybe even pressed it a little bit early to get all of that beautiful blue fruit and richness from the skins, but don't let it sit so long that it becomes undrinkable in terms of tannins. And so that became something that was, uh, that was something that we decided was gonna be one of the first wines. And so in 2013 was the first uh, vintage that we started making 51 weeks. We made Sangiovese and a Sangiovese Rosé, that was a Saignet, that goes back to that Genesis wine that I had mentioned earlier. And, uh, and Petit Verdot. And the reason that we got some Sangiovese, um, <clears throat> I love the Sangiovese that we made, but the reason that we got the Sangiovese was to make that rosé, because that, that Genesis rosé was the wine that Nancy and I um, enjoyed a lot when we were dating. And so it was a little bit of like, you know, there was a little bit of um, nostalgia for that and uh, just desire to kind of revisit that moment. Um, so at any rate, uh, Petit Verdot was, uh, you know, was was really something that we wanted to try and play with. And so we did that. We found some Petit Verdot. Um, it was well farmed, wasn't cropped too high. We brought it back and we destemmed it all. And when you destem Petit Verdot, this particular Petit Verdot, um, it, and you don't crush it, it doesn't really juice. So we destemmed it into a Macro 48 and uh, looked at it and we realized we just had a Macro 48 full of marbles. <laughs> and, you know, what do you do with that, right? And so, uh, we said, let's throw some sulfur on top, and it already had some dry ice in it. Let's cover it up, and, and let's see if it will soften up. We'll come back to it. So we kept checking on it, kept checking on it, and uh, um, about uh, day five or six, you could, kind of, you could kind of get to some juice down below, and so we decided to, uh, to pump it over really gently, and so we pumped it over really gently for the first couple days, but not moving it very much, trying not to over-extract, and it just immediately gets dark, right? And then, um, at about day two or three in the fermentation, you could finally punch it down. So then we punched it down and then we pressed it uh, right before it was dry. And so that was the first Petit Verdot. I think, we, I think we accomplished the goal. I mean, it was dark and rich and blue fruited and um, yeah, it was, it was uh, I think it was a success. And so that's been the style of Petit Verdot that we've gone after um, ever since. So you tell me about having a wine in the world that, that has your name on it. Uh, you have, you uh, tell me about selling it, tell me about sort of putting it in front of people and, and, and yeah. engaging their reaction to it. Uh, it's tough selling wine, yeah. Um, it takes a couple, couple knocks on the door to even get the appointment. Um, people like the wine, but the feedback was this is a hand sell. So we love the wine, the price point was fine, but if I bring this in here, it means that I have to hand sell it because People don't know what this is. At the time, um, I did some research online. This probably wasn't very scientific, but I tried to find every Petit Verdot that was made as a Petit Verdot from the Northwest. And in 2013 or 14, whenever we released it, I could only find eight. And so, you know, really it was kind of an unknown thing. Um, now, I did, the, I did the same thing exercise a couple years ago, and I found over 30. Um, just from Googling and, and, and looking. And so I think people now recognize the variety as a standalone, mm -hmm. but then it was kind of a bit of a weird idea. So it was a hand sell, and uh, we found that we sold, you know, I tried with some restaurants, but we found that we sold through club and word of mouth really, really well. 
because people who are, they want to find interesting, nuanced wines, they talk to their friends, and, and so we weren't making very much, you know. Um, I think the first vintage was, you know, maybe 80 cases of, of Petit Verdot, so that wasn't too hard to sell. Um, but it took some work, for sure, yeah. And how has 51 Weeks evolved in the, in the time you've been making it? Wow, well, we added Pinot Noir in 2014. Um, we, we added a Viognier Marsan, which turned into a Viognier uh, Marsan Roussan um, in 16. Um, so we added, you know, um, some, some different wines to the lineup. Um, we experimented with rosé. We made rosé out of Barbera starting in 2015. So we, we had fun and the, the, the spirit of the winemaking for 51 weeks very quickly became this experimental, um, non-traditional, let's do, hey, we're from Oregon and Washington, let's do what we think the best treatment is for this fruit, right? Versus being completely stuck in traditional methods, mm -hmm. which they're traditional methods for a reason, they work, but sometimes you get different fruit and uh, people, the consumer um, wants something that's made differently or that's, that's uh, experimental or non-traditional and we found that that was a lot of fun from a winemaking standpoint to play with. Um, so that became you know, our house motto and style in terms of what we were gonna do. So um, we, yeah, we did the Petit Verdot different than it's traditionally done in terms of no, no crushing. Um, in 2016, we added submerged cap fermentation. Um, so the first one was a uh, Barbera. Um, and I took the same fruit and I did a uh, big sister little brother wine so we took some of the fruit and we pressed it and made a rosé. And then we took some of the fruit and we did a submerged cap fermentation red wine with that. Um, and then so we released those wines together. And that was really fun because I was taking the same fruit, doing two different things with it and being able to have a conversation with people about what winemaking does with different approaches. And so that was, that was great. And so that's, that's the general spirit of the winemaking. So obviously we're here at, at Amatero today. So tell me about how this project came to be and how you came to be aware of it and be part of it. Sure. Uh, in 2013, I had a lunch with an old friend um, and the founder of, 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 of Amatero, one, of one of the founding group. And they had this site and they were trying to figure out um, if they could plant grapes. And so he knew that I was doing this as a, as a profession. So we had lunch, um, the, it was a great meeting. The next day I was here with a shovel and we were digging soil samples and looking at the site. Um, the, the founder of the parent company, Werner and Nissler, um, gave me a tour around the property um, and we, we drove through some of the old logging roads that are here and uh, um, kind of funny, he told me as we're, as we're driving on these narrow logging roads and he's turning the vehicle around, he had told me that, um, that that on a previous uh, trip up there, he had backed off the road once. It, but he told me that as we're up there for, it was, it was his sense of humor, which is awesome. <laughs> um, so I knew I was with good people. Um, and so yeah, we took soil samples, looked at, the, um, looked at the aspect of the different plantable areas on the hill, um, looked, at the top, looked at the topo maps to figure out our elevations, and um, that's when the conversation started about planting vineyards here. Uh, and that's really what it was at first. The idea was that um, we would plant vineyards here and that you know, maybe I would make wine off site um, for them and then that wine would, would, would be used or sold somehow. And it was, really it was more about planting the vineyards here. Um, you know, the, the, the ownership group, they're all wine lovers and so, um, and so that was, that's, that's kind of where it started. Mm -hmm. uh, and then it uh, grew into something else for sure. Um, so we planted the first vineyard um, on the way off Miller Road um, that you saw when you drove in. We planted that in the um, spring of 2014. So we pretty quickly jumped on planting some vineyards. Uh, and then, so we started getting those established. And then in 2016, the fall of 2016, we planted the, the front side in front of the winery, or the most of the block, we've added to it since, but in 16. Um, and off the block that was planted in 2014, we made the first wines in 2016 from that fruit. So, uh, so we were growing grapes and starting to make some wine. And over the course of time, you know, there's just uh, a lot of creativity with this group. 
and um, lots of questions, and I became just kind of part of the team as a consultant, and um, it was lots of modeling business plans on what if scenarios. So what if we did this, what would that look like? And uh, so I ran lots of models and did lots of studies and uh, for both the winemaking, the farming, uh, and earlier on I was doing kind of the general numbers on the events and the hospitality piece as the hospitality piece was growing. So it was through the course of just lots of back and forth and conversations that the, the overall concept for Amaterra um, came out of just from starting from just planting vineyards. So tell me, obviously, this is quite different than just planting vineyards. So right. that, that concept, um, how did this become sort of the, the, cho the choice and what was the process like of getting it off the ground? Yeah. Well, the, so it, it made sense to build a winery on the site based upon, um, you know, being able to have a tasting room here and have the vineyards on site. And uh, so the original winery was going to be built down near Miller Road next to the, next to the vineyard site there. Um, and then uh, this was relatively early on. I was still working at, at Paul. And I was on a, I had left for a, for a business trip and um, the, the, the CEO of the parent company um, was up here walking around. I was like, well, why don't, what if we put the winery right here in the saddle of the hill, which completely complicated the construction and design process, um, but ultimately was the right choice because of how we were able to incorporate the, the multi-level winery into the hillside and get the views. So it started out with a smaller winery um, um, with probably less of a hospitality component. And then when it landed here, it became clear that we needed to add more, more to it. Um, mm -hmm. And so, yeah, so that's how that happened. And that was probably 2016 when that decision was made to, to put it here. Mm -hmm. And so then it became a, um, a design process. You'd worked on a new winery before at Domain Serene, mm -hmm. so tell me about how that experience played into the design here and what you kind of saw as an ideal design for the finished product. Yeah. Um, so when you work in the wine industry, you're always dreaming about your, about your winery someday, right? Like how would you set it up, right? And so there's always this, well I think with most winemakers there's always this kind of vision for what ideal looked like rattling around in your head. And for me, it was always a winery that had two levels that you could use gravity, but not be blind to other steps in the operation. And so how you accomplish that, there's a million different ways you can accomplish that. But that was, that was an idea that was in my head that, um, uh, that, was, that was part of, part of this. Um, and so, um, yeah, so that's really where it started with the two levels here and the, we were fortunate to have um, a person on the project team named Pat O'Brien, who has you know, been building wineries in Oregon for a very long time and super knowledgeable. Um, so he was also a super key component. Um, but you know, really we had to decide what scale the winery was gonna be. So how many cases do we wanna make? Um, what kind of hospitality program do we wanna have? And at least start to have the, the scale of everything come into shape. Mm -hmm. And then once the scale is coming into shape, um, you know, then it, uh, then you have to land that, that scale into whatever the site is. And so our architect, Waterleaf, was fantastic, Stephen Lapp, um, helping us figure out how to fit this building with the multiple levels, with the two hillsides on both sides, and how to make the roads connect and all of that. And so once the, once the, the base level of the winery was landed in the top level, that's when we got to work figuring out the, um, the two levels inside. And so trying to accomplish that two level um, gravity flow winery where you're reusing the drop over and over, that was, that was the, the goal, right? Mm -hmm. And so um, originally the idea to move the tanks was to use a material lift. So basically a passengerless elevator to move the tanks up to the next level um, on the repetitive steps of transfers or whatever that may be. Um, and it was actually Pat O'Brien's idea to incorporate the bridge cranes and then uh, so we, we, we you know, really thought on that hard and what that would mean in terms of changing from a completely forklift driven winery to using overhead material handling. And the more and more we started thinking about in ways we can use this and how it, would, um, how it could be incorporated, the more exciting it got. Um, but there was a lot that had to be figured out because there's a lot of 
kind of standard production equipment that's out there. And to do something different is definitely going against um, the easy way. <laughs> so mm -hmm. there's a lot of custom fabrication. There's a lot of looking to other industries um, for um, different ways that things are done. And then how do you bring those over into, into a winery? Um, all while trying to make sure that we were staying true to the winemaking and the size of tanks that we needed to use for quality and incorporating the processes that we wanted to incorporate um, in terms of Pinot Noir and Chardonnay being, being the prior, priority for this winery. Mm -hmm. And so, um, yeah, and so we just did lots of research, uh, figuring out capacities and clearances, and there was just a lot of coordination meetings and design reviews and how much space do you need between things, and, uh, and yeah, so it was, it was a lot of fun. I personally, my role in it was to act as the, <clears throat> we didn't hire a winery designer, I acted as the winery designer. So, so my role was, and my goal was to try to not make any mistakes, right? So there wasn't anything that, at the end, I wish I would have done that differently, try to avoid those. But um, I took a, a bit of the continuous improvement stuff that I had done at Paul, and I tried to apply it the best I could to this particular process. Um, and so what I started with was doing a process map. And so I basically took the winemaking that we were gonna do, mm -hmm. and I um, mapped each variety um, with each step in that process, and then used that as the, as the, as the basis to the, to the design. Um, and so shared that with the architect team and with Pat and others, and Werner was very involved in the design too. Um, and so we used that process flow to make sure that as we were designing the winery, we were making sure that every step was, was captured um, and done appropriately and correctly for the scale of winemaking that we were doing. So you mentioned that you're, you kind of started as sort of just a consultant. Right. Uh, being a, tell me about you being coming from that to being general manager and winemaker at the finished product. Yeah. Well, so, um, so when the decision was made to, to, to go on the project, um, it was very exciting. Um, and then we all had a meeting and we talked about what the project was gonna need. And I said, that's great, we should probably you know, think about finding a winemaker because you know I have this other thing and that I'm doing full time. And uh, then they said, no, we think you should come and do this, right? And so, so I left my other job, that was in 2017. And of course there was always discussions before about what the long-term plan was, but, um, but it was 2017, which was before the construction started um, that I made the, uh, the move to come over full time to be part of the, the, the design, finish the design and build and, and then start to operate the winery. And so as the building is fi finish, it finishes up, tell me about getting into it, getting used to it and, and starting to work in it. Yeah, well, I mean, I would, I'd love to just tell you a little bit about the, about the construction process because there's some fun stuff that happened. Um, the, one of the most fun things is I got Champ. So he was a puppy um, right when the construction was starting. So he grew up with the project. Um, he was in the job trailer every day and kind of became the mascot and then ultimately the winery dog. So um, I kind of look at, uh, uh, anyways, I just think that's fun to mention. So we have some uh, great photos of him as a white fluffy uh, <laughs> puppy when the construction started. Um, but uh, but the, the, a lot of the design for, for some of the equipment off the bridge crane was happening during the construction process. And so um, with the design of the winery and the bridge cranes, one of the goals was to figure out how we could use the bridge cranes for more than just moving tanks, right? So um, there was a lot of ideas and things thrown around and we, I wanted to use these open top tanks for the fermentation but I also wanted to try to design a, a Swiss Army knife tank, right, that could do more. And variable capacity lids are great, but they're inconvenient with forklifts. And so um, we figured out a way to be able to use the bridge crane to set the tank lids. And we also um, had some racks built so that when we're doing open top fermentations, we can take the lids and then stack those over on the cart. So it looks like a rib rack in a barbecue with the lids. But that way you see a lot of wineries, the, the lids are stacked on top of each other outside. This way we can keep them and move the rack around. So that was one, um, one way that we uh, were able to use the bridge cranes. Another fun thing that, that, uh, that, that happened was we were sitting in a design meeting and we were looking at using a pneumatic punch down device that we were going to mount to the, 
to the girders on the bridge crane. And it was becoming very complicated and uh, wasn't really making sense to me that we were, we had this device that can lift really, really heavy things up. And why, why are we using pneumatics to push the light spool through the, through the cap for punch downs? So during a design meeting, I had this idea, well, what if we had a ballasted punch down device? So what if we had a punch down device that was essentially like a concrete block, right? That would sink through the cap and then we just lift it back up with the, with the bridge crane. And so I, I just kind of threw it out during, during one of the meetings and uh, people said, okay, yeah, that's, that's interesting. Like, what would that look like? So I started drawing um, what it would look like, right? And, uh, and so we actually did that. We fabricated, um, I did the calcs for it uh, in terms of the, the, the dimensions and then had a fabricator make this device and I could show it to you later if you want to see it. But um, it's essentially a, a concrete bucket that has breather tubes in it that's gusseted for support that hangs from the, from the bridge crane block. And we filled that, um, that bucket with concrete. And so I had this fabricated and then I got it back here during one of the concrete wall pours. And the contractor was, you know, clearly entertained by my excitement <laughs> and said, yeah, we can fill that with the building concrete. So we masked off this, this the, you know, the, um, the, the base to it and uh, they put it up on top of the building. I was up there with them and in between the wall pours, they moved the concrete pump over and filled this thing up. And the superintendent for the construction spent probably 45 minutes hand troweling the top of the concrete because everyone was just, it was just fun, right? Um, and then we put an epoxy on top, and so now that's our, that's our punch down device. When I was designing it though, I didn't have a winery to test it in, because there wasn't a bridge crane just sitting around for me to, to, to test this. And so I really, really wanted to make sure that I didn't design a barge, you know, that was just gonna drop on top of the cap and then float, because that would be embarrassing for a lot of reasons. <laughs> um, and so I had to use some sort of a calculation for a design standard, right? And so, I was just thinking about it and I thought, well, I've done pigeage on tanks before and I know the I sink. So what if I just use me as a design standard? So I took my shoe size and I calculated the, the, the surface area Then I took my weight and figured out the downward force that I needed. And then I, that was my target PSI downward. And then I made a spreadsheet that had the diameter accounting for the breather holes and the height of the concrete and made sure that the design um, size was the same as me on a downward, um, um, downward force. And so it turns out that it's actually four of me in its weight. Um, so it's, you know, between the, um, between the concrete and the stainless, it's about a thousand pounds. Um, and it sinks perfectly, <laughs> just, just like me. Um, <laughs> and so that was a design standard. So it was a pretty, uh, the first time we fired it up and used it, um, it was, I was pretty nervous because uh, it was a lot of work that went into it, um, but it works great. And, um, and it's gentle. And, uh, and that, was, that was the goal, is to be able to do punch downs, use the bridge crane. You know, uh, it's quite large, so that it, you know, it's, it's about the same speed as doing it manually, but when you do a lot of whole cluster, this is a lot stronger, so you can do those as fast as you can use uh, close to the end of fermentation um, punch down. And so, yeah, and so that was a fun thing with the, uh, with the, with the overall design. And then there was, we talked about the design um, of the winery, and there was one thing that I didn't really get to, um, that I did want to explain about the, about the building. And that is that, um, you know, there's always a lot of talk about Pinot Noir being gentle. And um, that was definitely a focus of the gravity flow and of the overall uh, winemaking design here. And one of the things that, uh, that, for me, I have an opinion on this, of course, but for me, a lot of the building and the processing equipment that you choose um, impacts the extraction on the Pinot Noir wines, right? And so if you, um, if you design a facility that has a lot of um, equipment design that has a high uh, potential for extraction, you have to be very careful to pull back when you don't want to over extract. And so I think of it like when a car idles, the idle speed of a car, you can always hit the gas when you want to, but if you need to slow down, you just take your foot off the gas. You're choosing how fast you go. And so I think about tannin extraction in wineries kind of like an idle speed for a car. And so I wanted to design a winery that had a, that had a low idle speed in terms of tannin extraction. But you can be too gentle, right, with winemaking. And so, um, so with that, 
this just gives us the ability to apply the, the interventions and do the treatments to, to extract when we want to, but because the building has a low idle speed in terms of extraction, it lets us be gentle easy also. And so that was also something I just wanted to explain in terms of, of a philosophy standpoint. You really did get to put a lot of sort of dream stuff into For this sure. winery. That's For awesome. Sure. Yeah, yeah. So tell me about using the winery and also tell me about, uh, you mentioned obviously Pinot Noir Chardonnay being the focus here. Yeah. Tell me about starting to make wine here yeah. and starting to develop sort of a house, a house style here. Yeah. So we moved barrels in in 2020 in December um, while the third floor was still being uh, constructed. And we uh, made wine in the winery in 21, um, again, while the building was still being finished. And so we were in here working. Um, we had a, 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 a conditional occupancy in the winery. And so it was, it was crazy making wine while there's still a full construction project. We actually had to wear hard hats and safety vests for the first probably, I don't know, six, eight months. And so it, uh, it was awesome, but it was also challenging um, in some respects, you know, in terms of access and things like that. Um, the first harvest went great. Uh, we, we have a really, really wonderful team here. Um, two of the core people on the winemaking team are people that I've known for many years, and we're kind of always actively recruiting to try to bring them here. And so they're on board, and uh, the first harvest was fantastic from a winemaking standpoint. The team really clicked, we had a lot of fun, super, super long days, because you're figuring stuff out. Um, but everyone was smiling, and I think the wines that, that came out of it in the 21 harvest were, the, were some of the best I've ever made. So, um, so that's been great. This year, we didn't have construction. We had a year of experience in the building, so it was even better. Uh, we were able to, well, also the, the harvest in 21 came early, and so we came off of a bottling date and then started to sample vineyards and realized we were gonna have fruit pretty quick. So we didn't really have a chance to um, get, as head, get as ahead on the tank cleaning and a lot of those things, so we were, we were, uh, we had a new crew, um, and we were. There was a lot of stuff that we would have done ahead of time that was mm -hmm. happening during harvest, and so that was that was challenging. Um, although people had smiles and we had a great time, but it was definitely we would have liked to have been a little further ahead that year. But I think everyone got caught on their heels a little bit with that vintage. Um, in 22, it was a super late year, right? So <clears throat> we uh, we had plenty of time to clean tanks. So, so this year was a very different year in terms of just being ahead, um, and, uh, and so that helped a lot. We also figured out some things in the building of ways to set things up, um, um, how to stage tanks differently. We do a lot of delestage here, so because we have the, the, the drop um, between the two levels, um, we will drain the tank out uh, in place, and then we'll use the bridge crane to lift the uh, the drain tank up and over, and then we'll park it over the top of the tank and then drain it back over. So we figured out lots of ways to, to do that better and to make that easier, um, um, as you would expect with a new, with a new winery. Um, you know, there's mechanical systems to understand, there's, uh, but all in all, it went really, really well. Yeah. And you mentioned you were very happy with the wines you made. Yeah. Describe them for me and what, what is it you're kind of aiming for here? So from a winemaking standpoint, uh, I personally think that it's really important to focus on texture and mouthfeel um, and to be super careful with your extraction. And I think if you're careful with that focus, the aromatics will also come along with it. Um, so we focus a lot on our, on our cap treatments. We look a lot at our cold soak length um, because we want to, and I'm talking about Pinot Noir specifically, but um, we want to be able to press, we don't want to have to wait to try to get more later. Um, this actually started uh, with 51 weeks when we added um, Pinot Noir uh, and I was traveling internationally. Nancy and I would do a lot of winemaking by text. Um, she would be at the winery and, hey, here's what I'm seeing, what do you think? And we started to do longer cold soaks, mostly because of a business trip. So we ran fruit on a Saturday and then I left on Sunday and I wasn't going to get back till the next Saturday. So we decided to let the fruit sit for seven days instead of four or five. And then we really, really liked what, what the impact was. Um, we figured out some tricks to keep the top from, from going volatile. And, um, and so we brought that longer cold soaks here. Um, and, 
in, uh, sorry, I lost my train of thought there. Um, so longer cold soaks here. Um, and we, yeah, so we focus on texture. So uh, um, trying to get more extraction to the point that we want it earlier, which allows us to press when we, when we want to um, based, upon, um, based upon where, where it is. The wines that we've made here so far, I think they're pretty typical of, of, of just kind of a style that's come over time for me. Um, we're doing a little bit more whole cluster over the years, um, just as kind of done more and more trials and just, uh, just tend to always prefer the ones that have a little bit higher whole cluster. Um, so, so we do a lot of that here. Um, the 21 wines are, they have incredible fruit tons of natural acidity. They're really bright um, with a really beautiful acid backbone. Um, I super varietal Oregon, like classic Oregon Pinot Noir with this really dark cherry. And uh, yeah, those wines I'm just really excited about. 22s, um, we had lower bricks this year, um, a little bit probably more acidity. So I think we're going to have, again, a little bit of a revisit to the older Oregon vintages with the with 22, but super high quality. The fruit was clean when it came in. We just had to be patient. Mm -hmm. um, and of course, you know, the yields were a little lower, but uh, yeah. And tell me about uh, getting the, the business off the ground, getting the hospitality program and all of that off the ground, especially in the middle of a pandemic. Right. Uh, tell, me, tell me how that's gone the last couple of years and what you're sort of looking ahead to here for the future of Amaterra. Sure. So one of the most exciting things about Amaterra for me, being a winemaker, and we talked about selling wine earlier, the hardest thing is to get people to try your wine. And the best way for someone to try your wine is with food and their friends. I mean, if you ask anybody about their favorite wine experience, it's always at a dinner, you know, with lots of bottles open and stories. And so this was an opportunity for that. And so we used the concept of the harvest lunch, which happens in wineries um, on varying frequencies at different wineries. But, you know, the idea is that you sit down with people that you're working with. You have a nice meal in the middle of the chaos. You open up some older bottles and talk about those wines and where everyone kind of shares where they were on that year and if they were working in the industry or if not. And they're just, they're just some of the best wine experiences. Mm -hmm. And so kind of the early conversations about the hospitality program upstairs was how could we create the harvest lunch, right, for everyone, everyone who comes here. And that would be the optimal way for people to experience the wines too. And so that was, that was kind of the guiding, the guiding light, if you will, for the food program and the hospitality program. Um, and then it really came to be when we hired um, our chef, Jamie, um, who kind of took that, um, took the wine inspiration um, with the food piece and, uh, and built out the culinary program. So during the daytime here, it's um, more of a tasting format. So there's not as much food. Uh, it's lighter food um, boards that are intentionally paired with the wines. Um, so it's kind of like a tasting room, but, uh, but a little bit more food than you might see. And then the evening we convert to, to really, you know, a full, a full dining experience upstairs. Pretty nice to be able to offer both of those things. It's great. Yeah. So I mentioned, I mentioned the pandemic. Obviously, you were doing a lot of work uh, oh. d during that. Tell yeah. me about 2020 for you and, and, and how you saw it, how it played out for you and how, how you saw it play out for the industry. Sure. Well, the pan I'll maybe I'll mention the pandemic and the hospitality piece first. Um, you know, we, the original business plans had a certain format that was before the pandemic, right? So lots of table side visits, lots of, you know, touch points and storytelling. And, and then we weren't open yet, but the pandemic started. And then um, the industry guidance was to not to have so many touch points, to pre-pour flights. And so it was during that that we were trying to understand what the world might look like when we opened up. Mm -hmm. And so we tried to be nimble in terms of the format. Um, but we did modify the original plan of how we were going to serve to pre-poured um, flights. I think it worked really, really well. Um, but, but certainly trying to figure out how to open a tasting room and restaurant in a changing environment, um, not knowing what's coming next in terms of you know, where the pandemic would be, um, it, was, uh, it was a dynamic time for sure. In terms of the vintage 2020, um, you know, we've had small smoke events before. Um, but, but nobody here really has experienced that before. And so um, I, I think people went a lot of different directions. There was a lot of 
help from technical vendors in the industry to try to help people understand what is smoke impact. OSU Extension did a fantastic job with webinars and, um, and talking about the, the science behind what, what smoke is and, and, and how it impacts the fruit and when it may or may not based upon the residence time in the air from when it went to the fire to the vineyard. And so I tried to follow as much of that as I could and uh, be thoughtful about how we made winemaking decisions. Um, I, I made the decision to not leave any growers hanging, so we took all of our fruit. Um, I wanted to make sure that, that all, of our vend all of our growers are friends at this point. Um, we work with great people that are aligned with us in terms of just their overall attitude and how they want to do business, but also their quality focus and their sustainability focus. And so those, those relationships are really, really important. And so my, myself and the ownership group here felt that it was important to make sure that we, that we stuck by our growers. Um, so, so we made that decision. And when you make that decision, you're making the decision to make wine. And we really didn't know what the impact was going to be. Um, so we did make some different winemaking decisions that year. Uh, there was two paths, right? You can either try to not extract it and just make rosé or make super light wines, or you can go for the extraction side, and if you get a little smoke in there, it's, it might be in the context of a larger wine with more flavor um, to be part of the overall wine. And so I went that way, and so um, we destemmed everything, and, um, you know, little, we didn't do cold soaks, um, a little shorter um, on the extraction side. But we built the wines up, right? We wanted them to be richer Pinot Noirs. And the vintage was going that way anyways mm -hmm. that was going to give us the ability to extract a lot of color and flavor. Um, and so that's, that's the direction that I went. We didn't really press anything very hard. So when we would press off the reds, we would only go to you know, maybe 20% of the pressures that we would normally. Um, so just super, super light squeeze. Um, yeah, and we, we make great wines. Uh, fortunate for us, the our vineyards were pretty far away from the fires. Mm -hmm. So we were fortunate in that we had a lot of time in between where the smoke left the fire and was in contact with the vineyards. Um, and it turned out really, really well for us. So we're, we're actually, we're serving our 2020 Willamette Valley right now in the tasting room and people are loving it. Um, and we're releasing two, sing the two single vineyards that we did do, we're releasing in our February club shipment and they're, they're great. Mm -hmm. So yeah, so I'm glad we made the call to make wine. Yeah. But light, no, basically no pressing. Um, yeah, just a very different approach. The wines are softer, um, definitely more fruit driven uh, and more approachable, um, younger than our typical winemaking, which has whole cluster. And so we swip the release uh, schedule because they're softer and ready to go, and people are loving them. So it's great. So I want to talk about the, the kind of industry overall for a moment. Uh, obviously, you've been in it about 20 years or so, yeah. a little bit more than that. Uh, tell me about the, the changes you've seen in Oregon wine um, and sort of what does the industry look like to you now as we're yeah. kicking off 2023? Yeah. Ooh, and the industry's changed a lot. Um, I, you know, I was fortunate to start when I did, I think, because I had some opportunities to work in some wineries that, um, that you know, maybe I, would, maybe I wouldn't have had those chances that, you know, now. Um, I think the industry is, the spirit of the industry is the same. There's a desire to collaborate, there's a, there's a desire to help out your neighbor, um, and that I think is the same. There's just more people now. And so before you kind of felt like you would walk into um, a tasting or uh, the symposium or wherever you were and you would kind of know everybody, and that's different now. There's just so many people in the industry, there's more wineries, there's more people to meet, um, which I think is good, but it's just different, right? Because you don't you just don't know as many of the people in the industry as you might have in the past. But I think the spirit is still there. Um, people are super friendly. Um, if you want to go visit a winery, I feel like I can still call a winemaker and um, they'd still welcome me, you know, like, 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 like always. Mm -hmm. So. What about what comes next for Oregon wine? What do you see for the industry's future? Um, I think there's going to be continued growth. I think the outside investment is exciting for the industry. Uh, I, I think that we're going to have, you know, the weather is going to continue to change, and so we're going to have to continue to be um, flexible winemakers on what the vintages give us. Um, and so I think that's a, a challenge for all of us, but uh, one that we just need to be ready for. Um, I think the industry is going to continue to carry on and grow. 
Um, I don't know, it's hard to say, right? But it's certainly on a good curve. So. And what about the future for Amatera? Obviously, yeah. the, the building's finally open and, and, and everything's, everything's no construction. No construction. Uh, so <laughs> uh, what comes next here? What are you looking ahead to, both the hospitality side, mm -hmm. winemaking side? Uh, what's, what's on the horizon here? I mean, from the hospitality side, we're just all really excited about continuing to build community. Um, our wine club has a great start, and because we're close to Portland, um, we have people visit more frequently, I think, than um, if someone has to drive further out. So we tend to have a bit more of a club feel here um, with a lot of repeat, uh, repeat visitors. So we love that community. Um, I think our challenge is to figure out how to um, keep providing um, consistency, but also kind of different things to keep, to keep people having, having new experiences here. Um, we have different programming during the seasons. Um, we're doing a wine club event or dinner every month, so we have a high frequency of wine club events. Mm. Um, we've opened our terrace down below for people to come when the weather's nice and just enjoy wine here. Um, and so just, uh, there's a lot coming in terms of the, um, in term, terms of events and dinners and things like that, and everyone's excited about all of that. From a winemaking standpoint, um, you know, one of the things that we do here with our wines is that uh, we, we grow some of our fruit, but we source from, you know, quite a few vineyards in the Willamette Valley, from various AVAs, from the Yellow Amity all the way up to Tualatin Hills, and I think almost all of them in between. And so the idea is that we can make a lot of either single vineyard or, or, or sub-AVA wines that uh, we can offer on a flight here, that people can taste different fruit and different wines from across the valley, just close in. And so we are doing the work to go out to get the fruit to bring the single vineyard or mm -hmm. AVA experience um, here. Mm -hmm. And so I think that's part of, the, um, part, of, part of what we wanna keep doing in terms of growing our vineyard relationships. Um, what's next for Amatera? Probably more vineyard sites and or some more estate acreage for us. Um, so that's definitely, I think, a goal that's out on the horizon that I'm very excited about. Um, I'd love to have our own Chardonnay site, too. Um, so yeah, those are all things. I think we're gonna, we're not at capacity for the winery. Um, so you know, we're, gonna, we're gonna continue to grow in our production. Um, yeah, on the winemaking side. Lots of good stuff to look ahead to. Yeah, for sure. I, I realized that I asked that you, you, you had talked about sourcing vineyards earlier and I kind of yeah. skipped past it. I'm curious about, uh, building those relationships, mm -hmm. uh, what have you looked for in vineyards that you are sourcing from? And um, as you're looking to grow, what are kind of the criteria you're looking for as you add yeah. new partners? Yeah, I, well, it's, a lot of the vineyards um, are people that I knew from previous um, professional roles. And so there's a lot of just talking to people that you've met over the years. Um, but there's also been some other fun introductions that have happened in terms of vineyards. Uh, we work with Diane Namarnik um, at Namarnicky Vineyard, um, and I met her riding my bike by the vineyard. <laughs> and I happened to just stop because I needed a break. And I was, over, I, was looking over, I was looking at the vineyard, and she came walking by, and I said, hi, is this your vineyard? And she said, yeah. I said, well, I'm a winemaker. And she said, well, get in here. <laughs> and, so I, and so I walked my bike in there, and, and we talked for probably 30, 40 minutes, exchanged contact information, and we were getting fruit the next year because we just developed a friendship. Um, and so we love that fruit. Uh, we started working with Hershey Vineyard in 2018. We met John and Linda at a dinner party in our neighborhood. And just, we both brought bottles and started having a great conversation and um, hit it off just personally. And then we were sourcing fruit the next year. And so, you know, that's been, that's been one of the most fun things about this, about this ride is not just developing the winemaking program, but developing the, the vineyard relationships also. Um, like I said, everybody that we work with, I would love to have dinner with and visit with, and they're all awesome people and very much aligned in terms of values. Mm -hmm. So it's been, yeah, it's good. And so uh, with 51 weeks, uh, uh -huh. tell me, is the, the future for that project, you have, uh, is it just gonna continue on as it is? Do you have plans yeah. for it to change in the future? Um, well, it's part of Amaterra now. And so uh, we do have plans to keep 51 Weeks, absolutely. Um, we refer to them as sister brands. And so while Amaterra is Pinot Noir and Chardonnay in very much traditional methods with maybe some slight augmentations in terms of some treatments, but really traditional Pinot Noir and Chardonnay, 
Um, the, you know, the Chardonnay is whole cluster press, oxidatively juice handled, barrel fermented, a little bit of concrete, um, but very traditional in the, in the approach. 51 weeks is meant to be equivalent quality and, and attention to detail in the winemaking, but continuing on with that experimental kind of spirit. Um, so you'll continue to see um, Petit Verdot's and the Rosé is under, 50, is under 51 weeks. Um, submerged cap wines, so we do one or two submerged caps a year. Um, and we do those as, uh, as, a, as a bottling alone for wine club. Um, you'll, you'll see just continued experimentation with that brand. We've done, we did a, um, like an air dried pasito style uh, Viognier last year, where we laid out Viognier one level, put it in the cold room with a dehumidifier and tried to dry the fruit up to, we got it up to well over 30 bricks and then did a dessert wine. So we're doing, we have a lot of uh, focus on the core Pinot Noir and Chardonnay, but there's this small amount of experimentation that over the course of the year, we keep things on the whiteboard of what do we want to try this year, mm. and then we do that. And so you'll see those wines with 51 weeks for sure. And what about for you? What comes next for you, either uh, in wine or, or things you're looking forward to outside of the wine world? Yeah, well, in terms of wine, I'm not done here for sure. There's a lot to do here. So continuing to build the winemaking program, the wine club piece, um, and just uh, enjoying getting to be the winemaker here um, after so much you know, thought put into it. So, so that's, that's you know, definitely, there's a lot to, lot to be done here still. Uh, for me personally, um, I, have, uh, I have a great family, two kids, and we're having a ton of fun right now enjoying them before they're gone, right? So we have four or five more years of this high school phase, and so that's really where my personal focus is, so. Uh, last question for you. Yeah. Uh, if, what, what advice or words of wisdom would you offer for someone interested in joining the Oregon wine industry? Uh, it's funny, we had this conversation at one of our harvest lunches. Um, somebody asked that exact question, and I, my response was kind of off the cuff, but I think I would, I think I would continue to tell this to people, and that's just, if you find passion in something, chase that. Because um, if you're truly passionate about it, it won't get old. Um, and, you'll, and, you'll, and you'll be happy. And I feel like uh, um, wine for me is that. So this, is, this, is not, this, this will never get old. Each vintage is different. Um, the people you meet during the harvest, all of it. It's the people, the wine, the fermentation aromas. Um, I feel like I've found that. And so my advice would be to encourage people to try to find their passion. And if that's wine, cool. If it's not, that's all right, too. All right. Yeah. All the questions that I have for you. Uh, is there anything I didn't ask that I should have? Anything we didn't cover here today that you'd like to cover? Uh, I don't think so. Excellent. Yeah, thank you. Excellent. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for your time, for sharing your space with us here, and uh, sharing your stories with us as well. We really appreciate it. Go ahead and let you off the hook. Thanks. Thank you very much. <laughs>